Alors bonjour tout le monde, on va commencer cette dernière et merveilleuse classe de maître avec Christopher Millard, euh, basson principal de l'Orchestre national du Canada et professeur à l'Université d'Ottawa, balado diffuseur, filmmaker, the list goes on. But without further ado, um, Chris, good morning. Welcome to you. Welcome to Orchestre de la Francophonie 2020. We're really pleased that you could join us today for this woodwind masterclass. Thank you, Maurizio. It's nice to see all of you. Many of you I've heard before. <clears throat> I've been playing, um, this is my 46th year playing professionally in symphony orchestra, and many things have changed over the years. The thing that has changed most for uh, students and young aspiring professionals is the access to material. So I want to describe to you when I was your age what studying and learning orchestral material meant. It meant booking a time with a school librarian in order to take out a score and either spending many thousands of dollars as I did on purchasing recordings of all the core repertoire or hopefully finding a not too damaged disc in the school libraries. I, I studied at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, so we had very good material. But nevertheless, every time uh, core repertoires came up, it was required a fair bit of uh, diligence and research in order to be properly prepared. Nowadays, you are all completely flooded by so much information that perhaps all of the easy access to information may be overwhelming. And I must say that in my observation of teaching many, many students, that I still have to remind people that the absolute obligation for attending a symphony orchestra audition is comprehension and score study. I have come to the point with many of my bassoon students where I, I'm less interested in saying when you play Tchaikovsky 4, I want you to play it exactly like this. And I'm much more interested now in asking students to please look at the score, look at the orchestration, look at the harmonic analysis, look at the structure, look at the rhythms, and what does that tell you and what does it mean for you? So I'm going to be using this time prim primarily to enter into a Socratic dialogue with each of you where I will ask you questions about your interpretation based upon score, and I will try to restrict my uh, criticisms to uh, not so much to my own subjective preferences, but to point, point it out to you where your own artistic decisions can flow from your own study better than if somebody tells you exactly what to do. So that is kind of the number one assumption and priority that we're going to make today. So we're going to begin with a Valentina Benici, who's across the pond today and in a very late time zone. And Valentina, and we're going to pull up a score here. And I'm hoping that uh, the people watching here are going, I'm going to try to manipulate uh, as we go. Now, in my time, it would have taken a couple of hours of effort to take out a score for Brahms 3. In, the, in our current stage, it took me probably 12 seconds to go onto IMSLP and download this. So, Valentina, if you would like to just take a moment and warm up your instrument, and then when you're ready, we'll go into the Andante of Brahms 3. So, I start. I play. Yes, please. Okay. Are you beginning at the, the top of the movement or would you prefer to begin later on? No, at the top of the movement. Thank you.
Now, I would make some initial comments, um, which are less important, but which will be obvious to you, is that you do have some issues uh, across your break, especially from the A to the B, that probably would have been solved if you were just a little bit warmer, and I suspect will be better now. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Yes. Samplice. Samplice and espressivo. Do you think that those two ideas are in conflict? No. How does one play semplice but espressivo? Uh, well, um, I would eat, I would think to something. Uh, yes, really semplice in the in the sense of uh, genuine, honest, mm -hmm. um, uh, like something from the country, or but uh, with. Uh, a lot of feeling with pathos. Sure, so, sure, yes. sure. And the semplice maybe comes from rhythmic simplicity? Yes, uh, in order to not overdo and to, yes. From what, my, from what I heard, that you take time here and this bar became slower than this bar. So if you're going to honor the concept of semplice, then I think you need to think more simply of the four bar phrase. Now there's some things that need to be revealed here. Your decision of the quality of your articulation on the downbeat of the second bar is a little bit at odds with Brahms' intent in the second clarinet of the two bassoons where the phrasing goes across the bar line. So if you are only studying the first clarinet part, and then a subphrase. If you were following the legatura markings as an indication of the partial phrases, you would be misled because this continuity here perhaps is more important than what happens here. Let's go further ahead. There's another spot where this occurs right here in this second statement here. Here, your decision of the kind of expression that you put into this octave might have been facilitated if you would consider that second clarinet and first bassoon have this continuity and the modulation to, to uh, very, very interesting tonality here, meaning that you could have done a, had more obligation to connect the phrase here in order to, to join what the intent was here. This and these two ideas are what are in a little bit of conflict. So with those two suggestions, if you take a look and look here in the second phrase, you finish here, there's a continuity in the first bassoon which carries your the sonority across the bar line. And yet you do agree here in a partial phrase release in all th three of these upper instruments. So taking a look at that in a more holistic way, can you play that again, playing a little bit longer lines so that the semplice, the rhythmic semplice is coming from your understanding of the interconnection of articulations in the other three instruments. Thank you very much. Now, we have one more thing to look at. Two horns are added in the upbeat to the third bar in both phrases. When we have two horns added to the 
uh, orchestration. It means that all of these solo lines and the two flutes here as well, you now have to project over four additional instruments. How can you make an addition of your sound so that the crescendo here is not just an espressivo uh, crescendo, but it's a recognition of the change of orchestration? The answer is you have to think about creating more body of sound here and more body of sound here. The flutes are not involved with the horns here, so you have a different issue. Okay, let's play one more time. And with that addition, you've achieved longer line. Beautiful. Now be aware of the richness of the orchestration with two flutes and two horns in the third and fourth bar. Okay, I'm going to stop you. This was so much more satisfying to me. And because I've spent my life playing Brahms symphonies and intuitively know this change of sound that must occur, when you open up your crescendo in the third bar like that, it reveals to all the other non-clarinet players on a committee that you've taken a deeper consideration of the orchestration. So that was much more satisfying to me. Now we need to move on. Can we talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to just switch screens here and we're going to do a little bit from the Sixth Symphony of Beethoven. Yes. Great. There we are. Yes. Does that look right to you? Good. Okay. play the arpeggios with beautiful control. Really, really lovely. Okay. So here is the essential challenge for the clarinet player is the alignment here and the constant and calm and steady 16th notes here, second violins and the cello. I have to tell you, Valentina, as beautiful as your sound is and your expression is so musical, sitting and listening to the silence here and imagining this ongoing ya ba 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 that entrance was always late and this was never quite a calm 16th note. Now, because I always think, but I don't know why I miscount in my head, I think. It's not miscounting. It's a question of the internal discipline of the continuity of 16th notes here, that this, this, is, this is the problem. Now, at the beginning of the movement, I'm a bassoon player. So at the beginning of the movement, this passage, we play together. Yes. And it, there's a problem here because uh, it, it, we look at this and we're trying to fit, how the heck do you fit this turn in and where do you fit it in relative to these 16th notes and these 16th notes? It's a difficult question. And I played this piece many times and I generally find that for the bassoon and the clarinet and the octave passage of the opening, 
that we can kind of rel relax the turn, begin it slightly before the bar line and be slightly lazier and don't be terribly worried about coordinating that appoggiatura eighth note with those two sixteenth notes. However, I think that the placement of this 16th note relative to this 16th note is absolutely critical. Because if you're late here as you were each one of these, then you're going to have a problem. So what I would suggest you do is first of all, play this for us a couple of times. We don't have to worry about the turn here. Play this and only go to the prepared appoggiatura here. But begin as you did before here. And as soon as you have established the velocity of the 16th notes, trust your internal clock. In tempo. Would you do that for us again, please? Sorry, from the beginning or from... How about we just play from here, the 16th note upbeat. Pro, sorry, can you show it? The ah. you, began, you began here. Let's begin the end of the next bar. Ba, 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 da. stop you. I would love it if you would take, doesn't matter which notes that you take, let's say, um, just take uh, the tonic and the third body. As 16th notes. And I want you to simply place that rhythm and pretend that you're playing this line in the, okay. in the violence. Ba da 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 just slurred. You just play just Okay, if you want to do the transposition, it's fine, but just ba -y -a -y -a -y -a -y -a -y. can be on the same pitches. Okay, so I want you to understand that you're a very fine clarinet player and all of us were impressed by what you've worked so hard on, which is this section here. And yet in an audition, if I was a violinist on the committee, I would be less impressed by your control over your articulation and your arpeggiation. And I would be more concerned by your lack of awareness of this in the rhythm here. So it's a question of expanding your concerns to every instrumentalist in the orchestra and recognizing that when you play an orchestral audition, only one or perhaps two members of a 12 member committee will be clarinet players and there will be other winds and strings and they will all be listening to your part from the context of their own experience. So. All I would say to you, I mean, you're a beautiful player, is that every time you are preparing an audition, take time to put the clarinet in the case and spend an hour with, in this case, the Pastoral Symphony and listen to a recording and follow along in the score. But don't follow along the, the, the first clarinet part. What you need to do is listen to it a couple of times and keep an eye on the string parts or keep an eye on the bassoon parts. If you listen three times to Beethoven six and force yourself not to concentrate on the clarinet part, but on the other instruments, you will have naturally enriched your knowledge of the score, which then you can bring to a more sophisticated execution of these excerpts. So the work that you've done is admirable and Please take my suggestion, just spend a little bit more time with the score study. Any okay. questions? Any questions? 
No, no, I, uh, I agree. I mean, okay. I, I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a question of t that all of us, not the, not just the six, the six of you playing today, but I know there's a couple of dozen people listening to this. And I, I hope that you all take to heart that it's a very simple process. Some, and sometimes instead of playing an excerpt over and over again, half an hour every day and, and working on the little details, sometimes you gain more by putting your instrument in the case and saying, okay, I'm going to take that 40 minute practice period and listen to this Beethoven symphony. And then the next day I'm going to listen to it again. And each time I listen to it, I'm going to concentrate on other things in the score. When you come back to your own instrument, I promise you, that you will be refreshed and invigorated and more optimistic about, about your orchestral wisdom. Okay? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you for staying up and, and playing for us from across the ocean. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so shall we go to Kyle? I'm sorry, Kyle, we had Luca Ortolani next. Luca, while you're warming up your read, I'm going to pull up Tchaikovsky 4. Hi, Chris. Hey, how's your thumb, Luca? Are you in good shape? Much better, yes. Good. Yeah. Good. It's getting better every day. So for the benefit of all your colleagues who are looking at this, I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the <coughs> canzone solo in the second movement of Tchaikovsky 4. Let's just take a look at the simplicity in the score. Let's do all of you who are just watching with Luca. We can see the tonality of B flat minor. We can see a one and five. We can see a very interesting chord here with G flat in the basis. B flat, D flat, a flat six chord. This is a very interesting moment. Then we go to the dominant. It's important for us to take a look at harmonic motion because harmonic motion more than anything else will help us decide how we're going to structure and make intelligent our musical grammar whenever you're ready Bravo, Luca. Okay, we're going to concentrate on two completely separate ideas that are revealed in the score. I have a question for you. Can you s sing for me the main theme of the last movement of track four? It's in F major. Um, dun, ba -da -bun, ta -da -dun, dun, 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 dun. Or so that's the, the opening of the first movement. You know how the yeah, last movement the goes. Movement. Okay. I'm not, I'm not. Too okay. So you, it's important that you know the main themes to Tchaikovsky for okay. because it's going to help illuminate for you what the meaning of all of these slur markings and all the articulations mean. It's a curious thing about Tchaikovsky for there is a, there is a consistency in the melodic structure, the melodic grammar in all four movements. Ba 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 a little 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 little. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, and then it might ba 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 be ba 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 ba. So, ba 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 ba. Be da 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 bam ba di da 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 da. And even the pizzicato, yup ba 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 ba. All of these principal themes are based upon four note descents. Okay. Including this one. Now here's the very interesting thing. The four note descent here, re. Do, Si, La, 
mi, re, do, la, and in inversion, fa, so, la, si, do, re, fa, mi, all of these groupings of two, three, four, one mm -hmm. are in juxtaposition to the natural meaning of a legatura marking in an articulation. Right. So I'm going to ask you, have you ever practiced this structurally and changed the articulations to be consistent with the idea of a four note descent? No. Well, let's do it right now. So this is what okay. we're going to do. You're going to you're going to just change your articulation here, so that you slur four notes, and change okay. your articulation here till you change, you eliminate that articulation. This is all going to be groupings from the second note to the downbeat, and I want you okay. to tell me what that feels like. Keep going. Good, Luca. Now, what is gained and what is lost? There is um, a bigger sense of moving to, to the downbeat if you're not tonguing to on, on the downbeat, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, the harmonic, um, the, the, the harmonies, I feel um different when you when you don't break it up with a with a uh, articulation um, and can you can you be more specific about how in this case the downbeats of the second and fourth bar relate harmonically to the structure so we have here an a natural yeah and we have in the orchestra b flat minor yeah. So a, a natural is a non-harmonic tone. It's a it's an appoggiatura from below. Right. Yeah. And in the third bar, this A natural hey, against the flat six chord, yeah. G flat, B flat, D flat, G flat, again mm -hmm. is also a dissonant appoggiatura. Okay. Which of these two appoggiaturas do you feel are the most poignant harmonically? The one that sits on top of the one chord or the one that sits on top of the flat six chord? To me, it's the one that sits on top of the flat six chord. I agree. So you're going to have to, have to leave room for the color here to be a more expressive color than this here. Okay. Okay. So still keeping this altered articulation, can you okay. demonstrate the difference in in your treatment of the two appoggiaturas relative to the harmonic content, but still with the changed articulation? Okay. Okay, so now let's introduce the tongue here to help you pronounce these two appoggiaturas. Okay. But what you just gained in terms of understanding the continuity of your airflow across the bar line, you see how much of that you can maintain. So it's a little of a juxtaposition of a specific kind of structure, the two and right. two and one structure on top of the language, the speech, the uh, the spoken content that comes from the appoggiatura. Okay.
Wonderful. I thought that was far more effective. Can I, okay. can I pick on you in a couple of little details? Yeah, of course. What is, what is the, the context? What scale are you playing in? Um, I uh, melodic minor, minor scale. Yes, B flat melodic yeah. minor. And the yeah. difference is, especially that you'll see here, is that... G natural. Exactly. So if, if you were practicing simply to understand the context of this solo within its natural harmony, you would practice from dominant to dominant, F to F, up and down in a B flat melodic minor scale without making the change okay. in the descent. I'd like you to do that right now and just show us your color palette of how your airspeed responds to the ascent of the octave fa so la si do re mi fa and okay. down. Just a simple slurred up and down scale as if you're a painter preparing a canvas, uh, preparing a pa uh, palette Why do you choose to change the vibrato so much for different notes? Um, it, um, I've actually been trying to um, not do that too much, but mm -hmm. it comes out in certain, in certain, certain patch, passages, especially in that um, one, two, three, fourth bar. Mm -hmm. I was noticing that I was doing it. Um, I was doing it to, to um, to accent certain harmonies and, and such, um, but I feel like it would be better served if it was a more even um, vibrato. Well, the, uh, right. better in terms of what your goal is. If your goal is as a painter to set up a palette and understand absolute sonority control within the scale of B flat m minor right. without changes, then it's important to be able to play it with a consistent color. Right. Do the same thing starting on F sharp and playing in B melodic minor. do that in a very organized with a very consistent color every note having equal life value In, in this context, we would keep the A sharp in the descent. Correct. Do you think you could play the first eight bars of the Andantino in B minor? You just played oh, the notes. It should be quite easy for your fingers to follow that. And the reason I want you to do this is because it's going to teach you a whole lot about what you're doing and not doing with your sound in the original key of B flat minor. So you're starting okay. on the third. Just take a quick look at the scale yeah. degrees. Three, two. Seven one five five two four three two seven one two two five. Understood? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. And we're all sympathetic. If you play a wrong note, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll <laughs> okay. get it's not easy to do, but it's extremely illuminating, and everyone who's listening today needs to do this kind of transposition work to really develop their own personal musical wisdom. Okay. Very good. Now that you have the notes, let's concentrate on seeing whether you can bring the poetry back in B minor. Okay. Isn't it a 
extraordinary how the oboe, or for me, the bassoon, or for those listening, your individual instruments, tend to um, push us in certain directions with our vibrato and our volume and our color, determined by what the resistance or tuning is on a particular note. And it will be very different Definitely. in B minor yeah. than it is in B, in B flat minor. The question for us as responsible orchestral musicians is to ask, did Tchaikovsky recognize that there's less resistance on a, on a, on a C sharp than there is on a D? And would he have cared? And the answer is no. Keep in mind that this uh, symphony was written the same year that Eugene Onegin was being worked on. So, you know, if you're looking for the poetry, listen to the letter scene from the Tatania's yeah. letter scene from the opera and come back and then you'll understand the interpolation of grammar and poetry. So there are two things I want you want to leave you with here. Well, perhaps three. First of all is do take a look at the other movements so you understand the structural similarities in the main themes. Okay. Practice those uh, altered articulations in order to get you past your obligations to stop the air at the bar line, which is a big problem for you. It's a big problem for all of us. We see, uh oh, here comes a bar line. I have to articulate it. Oh my God, how can the vibrato and the airflow continue? And you're dead. <laughs> but as soon as you okay. practice a slur across the bar line, you know what you're capable of. You know, all it is is a little motion of the tongue. Then the other most important thing is, and this applies to all of us, especially in melodic solos like this, take the time in your life to transpose them. You will have teachers who will say, I do this, I do this, you should put a crescendo here, group this, blah, 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 blah. But you know what, Luca, inside in your heart, you are as just as meaningful and poetic and, and musician as people who are 30 years ahead of you in experience. And you can get there very quickly by putting put in the music before the oboe, and that's going to come through these transposition exercises. Okay. Let's quickly take a look um, at Brahms 1. Uh, so you wanted the second movement of Brahms 1? Um, we can do second movement or we can do first movement. I'm just going to uh, stop the screen here. Okay. Uh, do you I'm want to do second? Either, just let me know. It's up to you. you. You want to do second movement? No, let's, let's do the first. first. That's fine. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's yeah. do the second movement because I've got it right okay. here on the screen in front of me and it'll save us right. all time. <laughs> and there we are. At letter B, correct? Uh, sure. Do you want to hear the, the solo beforehand or? Where would you like to start? Um, do you want to hear the one at, at 17 as well? Go for it. Question. Can you see the flute part here? Yeah. Play that. Now use your knowledge of the of the uh, of how vibrato can help you with crescendos and diminuendos. Bravo. Look at the bassoon part. Can you read bass clef? Uh, yeah. The notes are A, A, G sharp, G natural, E, B. Yeah. Play that. Play those two bars, top line. Uh, I'll do the yeah. octave lower. <laughs> A, A natural, G sharp, G natural, yeah. Okay, can you match the same dynamic hairpin that you do in the flute part? Of course. Mm -hmm. 
much, much better. But you know in your gut, that change of color, that openness, what Valentina had to work with in the, in the, in the Brahms three with the additions of flutes and horns. And I remember how beautifully she opened up her sonority okay. just to be aware of the expression of the other instruments. And flutes and bassoons are going to be manipulating the vibrato just as you did. Okay. Now play the oboe part again and place that within the context of what you just experienced from the flute and bassoon. Luca, you have a, a, a dilemma here. Your dilemma here is, are you going to presume that Brahms' structure in the flutes, the clarinets, the bassoons, and horns, yeah. and crescendos and diminuendos, are you, that creates a chorale effect. Are you going to allow your espressivo melody to be at odds with that? I mean, it's a legitimate question, and I don't think it's a right or wrong. But as a, as a maturing artist, you have to make this decision. Should okay. the shape of your dotted quarter F sharp be aware of the beginning of the crescendo on the second quarter of the bar? Should, mm. There's okay. a continuity of crescendo across the bar line, and the motion in the first bassoon in the second bar of a little bit more complexity on the eighth note, so that's all of that raises the question, what do you do with the continuity of vibrato on your dotted eighth note E natural? Okay. So what I'm asking you to consider is changing your conception of this to see whether you can illuminate the whole two bar chorale in a more unified way than what which is a little to my ear segmented. I see. Okay, okay you were extremely narrow in how you played the flute and the bassoon parts. Yeah. So I know you're you're capable of conceiving this in a in a multi instrumental uh, context. Try again. Let's do one change. Let's rewrite okay. this. Rewrite that first complete bar. Fa, fa, mi, si. Two F sharp quarter notes and an E quarter note. Sorry, you, you cut you, up there for yeah, a second. You're going to play ba da da. You're going to play C, si, re, mi, fa, fa, mi. So you're going to completely integrate with the chorale. Okay. And be really attentive to the continuity of your vibrato and make it one with the accompanying instruments. Okay. Luca, I think you're afraid of the articulation on the downbeat B natural. Are you, um, would you want to hear it a little bit more uh, like bigger? Okay. Okay. Take 30 seconds and play as written one more time and see mm -hmm. whether you can incorporate just what you did. I am not suggesting to you that okay. your B natural necessarily has to be the biggest note, but I think that you need to be able to organize your phrase in consort with the accompanying instruments and then be aware if you're diverging if your decision is to open up the second octave the e's and the f sharps and then to control the b natural i respect that but i think you should give some thought to the whole before you make that okay. decision okay so do it one more time as written for us and then we will move on
infinitely more satisfying to me. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who should we go to next, Maurizio? Should we go to a, Should we go to Kyle? Let's go to Kyle. If Kyle has his. Um, Kyle, would you please begin with the um, with the Auslieb while I attempt to find where my scores are? And I got it. Hang on. Hang on. I've got it now and I can everyone can follow along. Now what I've got here is a very simplified version in with transposition so we can see the tonalities in the oboe de Mare. Have we all got this? Okay. This is aria from the second part of the St. Matthew Passion of Bach. Kyle, can we stop there? Bravo. Yep. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a very interesting topic to bring up here, which is slightly different from in terms of just studying scores, but to talk about um, the nature of style uh, for American symphony, North American symphony orchestras, especially for flute players playing uh, Baroque repertoire. So during my lifetime, uh, my professional lifetime, there has been a massive shift in how flute players play this. Uh, the two of you listening today will be well aware of this shift and the influences that period practice has had on the modern flute that diverge from the kind of uh, extremely vibrant French school from which I, I emerged. So I, the question becomes here, Kyle, your tactic in presenting um, a rather detached um, legato, for example, your upbeat, and a purposely understated vibrato, and whether this is the best means in a symphony orchestra audition to make your case. And this is a very difficult question. There's not a yes or no answer, but I want to, I want to see whether we can find a way to bridge the gap between people on a committee of my generation who play in big symphony orchestras and recognize the importance of, of vibrato as a tool of projection and resonance and expression in a, in a large ensemble, how we can reconcile that reality with the undeniable um, influences of older instruments and period practice and what do we block flute to a modern gold flute and what is appropriate. Okay, so the, the two flute players who are listening to this conversation are not going to be surprised that I bring this up because this will be central to your decision making and in, in many of your conversations with your teachers and master classes and all that. And if we immerse ourselves even in online recordings of Aus Liebe, you're going to hear everything from on this scale of the equation, the hyper-Marsamonis French school, which you may hear from Denis Buryakov, 
in LA who will be playing this in a very tough and El Gobert style, or you can listen to various ways in which Paud plays it. The problem for many young players, and this, this, this is an interesting subject, the many young flute players are having to straddle and cross this rather treacherous divide without certain basics. I do think that Paud, who is one of the great flute players of, you know, of the last generation, has been able to play with what appears to be an essentially non-vibrato approach to things like this, but it actually isn't. And he's someone who came from a tradition of more Moise tradition of really depth of sonority, but recognized that uh, unlike what we hear in Moise recordings from the 30s, for example, where everything was just super vibrant and young players today listen to this and they think, wow, people were crazy. But they weren't crazy, it was a style. But there's ways to tone this down. I can remember, I worked with Moise in his classes for about three years, and I, I can remember quite, being quite struck one day he was working with the clarinetist Richard Stoltzman, who went on to have a, a terrific career. And he was, you know, he was working on how to get vibrato that was hardly noticeable. And then he would pick up the flute, Moise picked up the flute and produced this sound, which when you, at first glance, is always taking the vibrato away, except he hasn't taken the vibrato away, he's merely understated it. And the other thing that, has, that, he, that he didn't lose and know what Paud doesn't lose, which I think you lose a little bit, was taking that reduction of over the overboard richness in, in the actual size of the vibrato and allowed that to creep in to an interrupt, interruption of what would otherwise be a very legato vocal line. I can't not imagine what text the soprano would sing in order to have the detachment that you gave to the upbeat A natural. Okay, so that's me going going off on my granted. I'm I'm a in the orchestral world a senior citizen, and I have an older viewpoint. But it's important for all of you to recognize that it's a difference between when 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 you bring the Baroque repertoire to modern audiences. Of course, you want to to honor what we've learned from period practice. But if you took this into an orchestral audition, you need to carefully think of the group that you're playing for. If, if you're auditioning for tuffle music for a flute position is one thing. If you're auditioning with this piece for a larger symphony orchestra, it's a completely different aesthetic and you have to be able to somehow satisfy yourself that you're bridging that very difficult chasm. Okay, now I have a feeling you know exactly what to do. So let's give it another go. By all means, tone down the vibrato. Turn this technicolor gold, technicolor gold flute into something in a more almost black and white, but just a, a little, tone down the colors. But in no way tone down the, the vocal approach, the long line. Okay, I'm sorry, Kyle. What is what is your t text that causes you to go ba, bomb? Yeah. Okay. Why? I think I'm just focusing too much on the um, how long I want the first note, the kind of taper I want it, and not looking ahead. That this is okay. Do you know what I can tell you? Because I witnessed this many times. What Marcel Moise would have done in this instant, right now, in a flute class, he would have asked you to play an E natural quarter note upbeat to an E natural. Do it. What, are you able to articulate and keep the vocal cord vibrating? That's yeah. the, the vocal metaphor. I, I cannot imagine if you were to sing me, me, you would not stop your vocal cord from vibrating. You would go, Mm, me, me, and you would find a way of 
articulating in a slight alteration to the airflow that would make that clear. Good, now do with a D natural upbeat. Why is that more separated just because it's a major second? Can you imagine a, a violin in your hands? The connection from the up bow to the down bow, irregardless of what the vibrato in the left hand is doing. Good, now a C natural upbeat. There's a larger gap to be expressed there. A, ma a major third is something different from a major second. Can you sing this on one vowel? Take the flute out of your mouth and sing it on one vowel. La, la. Okay, now do me. So I sing do me. Do me. Now sing it like you love it. <laughs> do me. Thank you. Now play like that. Okay, now a B natural upbeat. A fourth is something in the human voice that's more than a major third. Is there an issue across the break for your for flute? Try slurring it so we know that it's not in the fingers. Okay, so just be gentle and precise with the tongue. Thank you. And now the fifth, A-E. Okay, so that is how Maiz would have solved this problem. So you recognize there's no change of resistance when you play from an E to E. And as you make a larger interval, you need to get through these expanding intervals in order that you don't fear them. And you know, you hear of great singing teachers will talk to singers about the difference between here and here. And, and, the, and the singer might say, oh, it's such a big jump. It's a fifth or in Mozart, it's a 12th. And a good singing teacher will say, yeah, but on the vocal cords, it's this far apart. So don't be worried about a fifth. Okay, out of this knowledge of the continuity of your first note to the downbeat, I hope we can set you up for a much more vocal line. Focus on the bow and less on, on whether you're doing a lot of this or just a little of this. Very good. Here's some things for you to consider. Look at the tonality here. We need to transpose. Of course, we have A and C, and then we have the major second here. I don't think that you are responding in the in the Obermores here to the to the dissonance implied in the second here, and really expressing the appoggiatura adequately here. So maybe you're very committed to taking most of the vibrato away. But maybe you start to think, where can I really use vibrato as a tool of projection? And appoggiaturas are going to be one of them. This one here a little bit, but certainly the longer appoggiatura here. The other thing I want to mention is that we have a, usually an organ accompaniment to, to, to this as well. So there is a continual accompaniment, but do note structurally what goes on here and how you have an obligation in this fourth, mar fourth bar to have to match the dancing movement in the, in the two oval parts here. I felt that you knew there. 
Uh, Maritza, what I think is, well, he comes back on. Let's go to another player. And if we have time, we'll come back to Carl. So I would love to go to uh, Ingrid and do the Hindemith um, symphonic metamorphosis. Ingrid, thank you for your patience. Will you please take a few, uh, 30 seconds or so, get the flute and your lips warmed, warmed up. And when you're ready, I will share the screen with everyone for the third movement of the symphonic metamorphosis of Hindemith. <clears throat> Here is the melody in the clarinet. So we're essentially a temple of da -di -da -da, da -di -da -da. I don't have perfect pitch and I'm not singing in the correct key. And then at the fifth bar, the bassoon takes over the theme too. So the fourth is this tremendously complex, uh, complex uh, counter melody that goes on here. And the issue for them has to do with momentum and breathing. And what I would like the rest of you following the score is to see where you can pick up where the challenges of all of these 32nd notes begin to impede upon certain so natural natu momentums, for example, the clarinet line here and the English horn line here. So we'll be watching for that while Ingrid is playing. Have we got audio now, Ingrid? Yes, I'm back. That sounds good. Let's give it a try okay. with your up upbeat and then begin. Bravo, beautifully played. So all your, your colleagues have been watching along the score and they respect the difficulty of this and the breathlessness of it all. <laughs> Let's take a look and you will remember that we had Luca do some things on the spot that were not too easy to do. So I'm gonna ask you to do a couple of similar things. Mm -hmm. uh, are you comfortable in bass clef? Uh, are sort you of. <laughs> Okay, uh, so that you don't have to transpose the clarinet accompaniment, we'll go to what happens in the melody at letter C here. Can you see this is B flat minor arpeggio? And then F minor six arpeggio. Can you play this melody as you would like to play it as a bassoonist? Okay. Should you be so lucky as to be reborn as a bassoonist? Okay, now let's find the tempo that you believe the movement should go at, which is considerably faster than this. Okay, so two, two things just happened, both of which were wise. One is you played faster, but also you moved from, from, from six into two. So the first question that I want to ask you pertaining to how you organize your sonority in some of these big bars, are there ways for you to think in a rather than a six beats in the bar or two beats in a bar that would involve some change in the amount of, 
the strength that you put here, how much you drop back in here. Is there a way that you can honor the feeling of the melody of beats in a bar rather than one, two, three, four, five, six, one uh, and a two and a three uh, and a four uh, and a five and a six, which you're playing fabulously, but I think would be more sophisticated, even with, at the same tempo, if you could play it in one. So your internal metronome in one. Let's start the excerpt again. We'll play the first four measures and see whether you can imagine a very patient metronome in the background. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Excuse me interrupting. Okay, very good. There's various ways of doing this. Let's try a little exercise here. Let us take the primary notes on each of the eighth notes of the bar. D, mm -hmm. B flat, B flat, mm -hmm. B flat, E flat, B flat. Now let's play them in six. One, two, three, four, five, six. As if that is the melody. Okay. something wonderful happened is that in that first complete bar you had tremendous direction moving into the third uh, into the fourth beat of the bar it was marvelous can you bring that to the context of all of the 30 second notes yes okay stop you first bar fantastic let's do the exercise in the second bar we'll just i'll help you a bit here mm -hmm. f e flat d b flat g flat e flat as a melody in six mm -hmm. go sorry yeah they're just the primary note f E flat, D. Mm, yes. Get, just follow the principal notes on the every four and every fourth note. Can you play that slurred and shape it the way you believe? Uh, I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry. Can you play? Can you put a slur mark over it? Yes. And, okay. and play it as a melody with the crescendo. And with expression, as if this is all Hindemith had written. Yeah. Maybe you can do one thing different now. In the second half of the bar, you can do the subdivisions. So this note, this note, D flat, C, B flat, you know, every second note. Go from here. Bump, one and two and three and. Mm -hmm. Even just bop, 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 bop. Four, uh, five, uh, six, uh. Okay, now, can you do that whole bar like that? S simple eighth notes here, sixteenth notes here, and now do it in two in a bar rather than six at the same tempo. I have to play all. I want you to simplify it. Eighth note, eighth note, eighth note, eighth note, eighth note, eighth note, but in two. 
Okay. Fa, mi, re, si, so, mi. And now slurred as a melodic line. Beautiful. Now we're going to go to the introduction, introductory upbeat again here, which by the way, traditionally flute players will subdivide and a conductor will generally allow this yum ba 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 bum ba da di da 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 you can get away with much more of a, a calando right here and then find your tempo at the 6-8. So if you could do that and then concentrate when you get here to finding the two beats in a bar and the melodies that you just established. Mm It's much better. You know, um, our, our, I don't know if any of you remember that he died before all of you were born, but there was a very famous French mime artist, not the flutist Marcel Moise, but the mime artist Marcel Marceau. And I remember going to see him often when I was a teenager, he had traveled and he just did mime. It was wonderful because he has an, had an assistant who came out on the stage before each of his uh, mini acts and held up a sign and said this is the baker or the poet or girl on a bicycle or whatever it was but this man his only job was to walk out on stage hold up a sign with the most elegant style that you can possibly imagine and then we knew what story we were going to see without words and in a way this introduction here has to be someone coming on to stage so we now have the most virtual so elegant flute player you have ever heard one and two and three and mm -hmm. ba -da -ba -ba -ba. i think that you're stuck in a groove here playing this metronomically and it's not necessary take your time okay and imagine that you're setting up the character what is the character well the character is something you you understand the character you play it wonderfully so you dance on top of this underlying melody in two and a bar. So it has to be, it has to be like this, but pulsed in the larger meter in order that it's not frantic. One more time, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, bravo. Promise me one thing that for a few weeks, you will practice this with a slow metronome, two beats in a bar and not in six. I okay. think it will, it will help you a lot. Mm -hmm. Let us move to Brahms four, last movement of Brahms four, please. Okay, yes. Okay, folks, uh, beginning here, the top line of the flute is the excerpt, uh, 
it's the beginning of the melody, but the excerpt almost always begins with these triplets right here. And that's where she will begin. Okay. Is that okay? Would you like to start it a little sooner, a little before that? Uh, no, no, I can. Uh... I think just maybe just the downbeat here on, on the on the G sharp at 89 and then go right into the solo. And we will all follow along to see the context. Mm -hmm. When you're ready. Thank you. Bravo. I have some questions for you. Yes. Okay. Right here. Your articulation. How would you imagine the first and second violins are using their bows here? Uh... Take a guess. Are they doing ba 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 Try to try to figure out what you that's going to sound like in the first and second violins? Um, maybe the, the second uh, proposition. Can you, would you agree or disagree that this measure and this measure are in 9-8 and in this measure and this measure are in 3-4? Um, Does that make sense to you? Yes. In other words, from the beginning of the measure, from your G sharp, is a, is containing a triplet. One, two, three, four, and a triplet one, and. And that, yes. that duple has to be patient because now you're in three, four. Triplet, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. I find that flute players do not give enough to condition to how this must be part of this. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest you to do is actually, you see what the first violin does here? You could do this. Sol, re, re, G sharp, mm -hmm. D, D. You could do that here. Bom, 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 B, ba, 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 ba. Yes, okay. B, F, F, ba, ba, B. If you do that, you really will be obligated to play in chorale 9-8 with the first and second violins. Mm -hmm. Can you try that, please? Ba, be, ba, 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 be, ba, ba, ba. Yeah, that third bar will be, third bar will be C, fa, 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 mi, fa, so, fa. C, fa, 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 mi, fa. Ah, oui, yes, okay. Yeah, third bar. Now, a very curious thing happened to your shape of your crescendo diminuendo. When you did this, you gave more resonance to the D natural on the third big beat of the bar. And before, you gave more resonance to the C sharp. So that you confused two groups of three with three groups of two. I constantly hear in flute auditions, flute players playing ba 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 with emphasis on this note and this note. Mm -hmm. And yet that would never happen in the first and seconds. 
So the very fact that you've started to play this as if you're in the violin section helped you find the right sonority and resonance here and put a little emphasis on the beginning of the triplet rather than the C sharp and the E. I think that's extremely important for a flute player showing an orchestral panel the context of that part of the solo. Okay, now yes. let's talk about this. Okay, so I want you to take a look at this key signature. It's a very curious thing we sometimes see in Brahms. Do you think that this this is in three or is it really a six four? Oh. Enough. In other words, is this a 3-4 measure and a 3-4 measure and a 3-4 measure? Or do we actually have a strong beat, a strong beat, a strong beat, a strong beat, and a strong beat? I think it's very important to understand, are you, is, is this truly 3-2 or is this one of these things where Brahms, in the structure of the Pasacaglia and the uh, change of the Pasacaglia to a different meter, is still in three? I think it's a very important consideration. When you look at the end of the solo, in the clarinet here, this is this is a three-four measure. This is a three-four measure. We revert immediately back to triplets, and yet very often flute players don't really pay attention to whether this is a three-two or six-four. I want you to think about this. Mm -hmm. Talk to your colleagues. Talk to your teachers. Ask them which conductors have they seen conduct this in three. And which conductors conduct this in two? I've seen it both ways. It's an important question because it will inform your vibrato, your shape, your sonority in a big way. Mm -hmm. If this, if right here is the middle of the bar in 6-4, then the rest is the strong beat. And the rest is the strong beat. And it corresponds here with the two horns and here. If this is in 3-2, then this is a strong beat, this is a strong beat, and this is a strong beat. You need to figure out which of those ideas make sense to you personally as a musician. Mm -hmm. I would love you to play this right now clearly in three beats in a bar. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, excuse me, one. Two, three. You understand. Mm. Play it clearly okay. in three, two, as if there's a metronome at the half note. Okay. sing this and I don't know how your conducting skills are but we've got we're all gonna we'll put you on the spot and you I'd love to see you conduct yourself and sing it are you going to go I'm in the wrong octave I want you to try that and see whether you think it is natural or not Wonderful. That's so, so beautiful. Now, can you do it in two in a bar? Yes. Uh, uh, and conducting and singing again. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know you can play it beautifully in the flute. Let's see how you, how your heart speaks to us singing it in two in a bar. So, okay. ba -de -da -da -da, yeah. ba -de -da -da -da. does this make sense is the question. Fantastic. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's very different, isn't it? Yes. Uh, 
this. <laughs> I, I think that you need to think about this. I'm not going to tell you what I think is correct. I have an opinion, but I think that because I've s seen conductors do this both different ways. There's something that t is very important that flute players ignore, though, in the accompaniment, which I think is for, whether you decide to do this with the larger beats or the th three beats in a measure, you can decide. Right here, this half note with a swell. It occurs in the second bar when you have this marking. Mm -hmm. And it occurs in the fourth bar. There's a half note here with a swell. This is treat this and this both are treated with the crescendo, which matches this. Then it happens again here. So whenever you have this and this, you have an orchestration issue that you're having to overcome, which is the half note swell in the horns. I find that most flute players play this as if all this was was a quarter note with a quarter rest. And it's a very different experience in the orchestra. And if I was a horn player on the committee and I, in my mind, I know that I'm going this, 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 and then espressivo here. If you do not show me that you understand the necessary change in projection to deal with this extra information in the orchestra, then I will be disappointed. <laughs> okay. okay. And I want to say one, we spent a lot of time together. I'm go, before we let you go, I want to talk about one more thing. And I'm going to return back to my roots as a young man when working with, with Moise. <laughs> and I remember in, in many times hearing him teach this. It is a real feature of that kind of flute playing, which is not has changed. I mean, I understand, and you're a French flutist, and your influences may be through Moise's grandchildren or grandstudents, I don't know. But the one thing that he would have done here is that he always treated appoggiatures as the note that takes vibrato. That you either give an agogic accent, meaning a, length, a lengthening of the appoggiatura, or you give it vibrato, or you give it both. But in many cases, you chose always to vibrate the resolution note. But it's the appoggiatura that is the interesting note, because it's the note that doesn't line up with the harmonies. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to remember is in the Brahms Forms solo is that you have appoggiaturas. Here's, here's one, here's one, here, here, this is not an appoggiatura, but has the same expression. Mm -hmm. Here, here, here a little bit, this one. And then you see some of the appoggiaturas are from underneath, resolving upwards, resolving upwards, resolving upwards. And generally speaking, that as we're developing, we see more of the appoggiaturas that give forward momentum are resolving from a lower note to an upper note hear from an upper note to a lower note. You need to play with these ideas. Okay, let's take 30 seconds, please, and have you play the whole extra again, thinking about that change of your triplets in the introduction. Mm -hmm. And let's see if you can come up with a way of feeling with the, uh, to play this just as you sang it, which was so magnificent. Okay.
I think you have a beautiful heart in your plane. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Luca Marcou, Brahms Violin Concerto. Does, can you hear it? Yep. Bravo. You, you uh, have a good conception of this. I want to tell you a very funny story, Luca. You see right here, I'm a bassoonist. You see the first yeah. and second bassoons, they come in, oh, look, there's nobody else. You have to come in together. Bassoon players always worry about this entrance. We were doing a performance of this once with uh, Pinka Zuckerman and Zubin Mehta was conducted. And in the rehearsal, Zubin said to me right here, do you want it slow or fast? He says, question out of nowhere in the middle of rehearsal. Second movement, he says, do you want it slow or fast? And I said, well, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know how to answer it because yeah. I didn't understand what he meant. And then I realized that he is so experienced a conductor. He realized that if he did this, it's more difficult than if he simply went bang. Yeah. All right, extremely wise. It makes no difference to the character of a major third if a conductor does this. I bring this story up because understanding whether to give this as an eighth note upbeat or even a sixteenth upbeat as opposed to a quarter helps us understand how to get together. Right. Now, building what I said to Ingrid about the symphonic metamorphosis, meter is everything in here. I feel you're too much in 4-8, and I'm not saying necessarily that your tempo is too slow. But I'm wondering whether you can find a way of allowing some of these weaker, weaker tones here, right. here, to pass through them a little bit, to pay attention to the, to the, to the size of the, of the vibrato, the kind of resonance you're getting on the primary beats if you're in 2-4, as opposed to what you're getting in 4-8. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. Yeah. So I, we're going to hear this again, and I just simply would love you to play it in two. I do think it's, by current standards, it's on the slow end of, of tempos. But it's not wrong, but I think if you took 20 performances of the Brahms Violin right, Concerto, this would, be, this would be a pretty much at the slow end of things. The one oboe criticism I want to make is that I don't know why the sustained Fs here are a little under in pitch. You're having trouble holding the F up. It's funny because these Fs are nicely in tune, but when you come up the fourth, your fourth is too narrow and you sit on these two Fs, just you've got to get them brighter, whether it's a question of airspeed 
uh, vibrato a little quicker and vibrato placed a bit higher in the pitch center so that the vibrato is not drawing your color down. I think you're looking for resonance and you're playing four or five cents too flat to get it. Okay. So those are my two comments to you again. I think that you have, your breathing all makes sense. You've I think you've studied the score. You know where the, where the other moving parts fit in. So just see if you can pull this together in, in two, four rather than four, eight. From the start again, please. Okay, do me a favor. Just play right here your yeah. lower F. Play. I want to hear your octave F. How it's how it opens. F to F. Good. Okay. Now, play. Right. That's better. You got to be careful there. You're yeah. you have allowed yourself to to be persuaded that the rich color when you're playing a little flat is 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 okay, but it, it isn't quite. Right. What I would suggest in order to help you get a feeling of two in a bar is that, for example, the amount of vibrato that you use on the Fs here. If you if you just understated the vibrato here, then then this F would be less projecting because vibrato gives so much information because you get this variability in pitch causes an instrument to increase in complexity in overtones. We use vibrato because it, it changes the fundamental pitch many times a second and it it enriches all the overtones because of that change. So vibrato is a huge tool for getting sound out and projecting. In the case of trying to play 2-4 instead of 4-8, you need to look and think, are the weaker beats coming out? Are they getting accented because of the kind of vibrato? Understand? Yeah. Give it a try again, please. was fantastic and just the adjustment on that one f suddenly allowed that first bar of the solo to flow so just be really really aware it's funny that that my criticism of vibrato and my criticism of pitch were on the same note right yeah, yeah it's a really really very impressive um i'm not sure if i could pull up the score but could you do scala de seda for us quickly yeah yeah well, perhaps while you're Thanks. playing if i can do a quick download i i will but we'll listen while you're while you're playing and uh, do slow and then fast Yes, please.
What's a hard excerpt to play when you've been sitting and listening to some stupid bassoon player talk for two hours? And <laughs> retread? Not bad. Okay, let's go quickly to the top. Now, again, can you extrapolate the ideas I just suggested to you about vibrato and how you can help momentum yeah. by reduction of vibrato? Here's a very curious thing that, that I feel very strongly. I love all of you wind players who use vibrato to consider the following statement. It is wonderful. Even a, see this patches I'm circling here. It is possible to play this chromatic scale with vibrato and then it becomes very rich and, or to play some portion of it with vibrato and it can be done. And I often try to play passages that are moving passages with a kind of a spin to the sound where I'm activating the vibrato mechanism, even while I'm moving my fingers, it's okay to do so. But the problem is that very often when we mechanically add vibrato to our plane while we're moving our fingers, we lose forward momentum. And one of the biggest problems of using a lot of vibrato during a moving passage is it sometimes takes us away from what, what our momentum is. So that's a question for you to consider that maybe from a vocal point of view, you want to vibrate the top end of the oboe here to, sh you know, we paid $500 to come and hear your recital. And I want my $495 worth out of your high D and your C sharp. But then maybe what I want to consider as you move down the scale here, that I'm not so interested in a lot of wobble in the sound here. I'm more interested in the falling forward into the next bar and vibrato may get in the way of that. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Let's see what you do with that, please. Let's start again on the G. Sorry, just start there at the beginning. Uh, uh, let's go from the beginning. You already you already changed some things just based based on what I just said. Think even more. I would personally, if I was playing this, I would keep develop the spin here into the suspension of the E, and then this is the moment where I'm paying where I paid my five hundred dollars to hear the expression in your ascending six. And then you did reduce the vibrato here a little bit. I agree with that. You still want to move here, relaxing to here. So right. somehow this turn has to come within the expression of an agogic accent from the C to the G. Think the long 2-2 two -two phrase. Once again, so keep developing this E. Okay, now for the benefit of everyone following, let's just take a quick look at the different harmonic context. We're in C major. This is a five chord. It's a five seven chord in, uh, with the fifth at the bottom. That's obvious. Here, we don't experience this move from D minor to the diminished, diminished quality until right here. So if you can feel the tension, if you look at this E, G, C sharp, this it's an incomplete dominant A uh, producing a, a diminished seventh quality with a suspension that this is the tense point here and that this color needs to be differentiated from this color because of the harmonic implications. Okay? Mm -hmm. One more time. Take it to another level, yeah. Luca. Bravo. Very sophisticated playing. Thank you. I, unfortunately, we, I haven't even got to Matt yet, and we've got to this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, we're going to have to leave it like that. I'd love to hear you play again sometimes. It's a wonderful playing. Can we go a few more minutes and fit Matt in, Maurizio? Uh, 
All right, so Luca, as long as we have an opportunity, let me try to help you with the, with the technique. Yes, okay. All right, so let's go to that. I am infamous in the bassoon world. That there, I have the worst, slowest single tongue in the universe. So I've had to learn to double tongue. Do you double tongue? Uh, that was double tongue, yeah. Okay. Would you do me a couple, just while we take four or five minutes to wait for Matt, let me just take you a little bit of exercise here. Do you practice your double tongue fully, lega fully legato and fully stopped? In other words, ducka, tucka, 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 or tucka, 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 tucka. It's mostly tucka, tucka. Okay, I had a feeling that's the case. That's yeah. a very important thing to do, but it's only half of the puzzle. Right. So what I would love you to do, let's take this high B and repeat yeah. it eight times. And what it's going to be at a s uncomfortably slow double tongue tempo, ta ka ta ka ta, where you're basically keeping the air moving and you're finding that journey from the the tip, the we'll call it the ta and the yeah. ka, which is up at the roof of the mouth, quite forward, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, it's important to remember that in a double tongue, you can't have a big open oral cavity for resonance like we do yeah. normally when we play. I mean, things have to be kind of reduced. Because when you're going from the cuss stop, you've got a lot of space around the reed. And the more space you have around the reed, the more inefficient the re-energization of the sound is because that space in your mouth that's in front of where the tongue stop is has to be repressurized. Double tonguing is such a difficult thing to achieve. So remember to try to keep things little. So not ta ka ta ka ta but very small. Yeah. But you can still practice it very legato. Okay, take the high B. Okay, so we can hear that the K is slightly weaker than the T. Start on K. Okay, so some things to be aware of. There's always a pitch change between the T and the K. More on the bassoon than on the oboe, but we hear it on the oboe too. The more in tune you can keep the weak syllable, the better your technique will become. Because in, in creating the tuning, we, we do the tuning by correctly reducing the size, the space in the mouth and keeping the embouchure in the optimum position. Mm -hmm. So if we're hearing a change of pitch between the ta and the ka, fix the pitch and you will at the same time improve the efficiency of the ka. Right. Once again, Try to, try to aim for a couple of things, that the air never stops moving. Mm -hmm. I know you're thinking about the tongue. We all think about the tongue when we're double tonguing. Yeah. But the important thing is to really remind yourself, it's about air, Luca. It's about air, Luca. It's about moving the air. So keep that B vibrant all the time, and don't worry if it sounds weird. Keep it in tune. ta ka ta ka ta ka Bravo. Okay, so go back and forth, go back between ta start and ka start. Okay, okay so now go ta ka ta ka ta, ka ta ka ta ka, ta ka ta ka ta, ka ta ka ta ka, back and forth. No, not the legato. Right. You immediately went to your default of tick, yeah. tick, which is like a tongue stop single tongue. It's yeah. useful, but it's not appropriate right now. Okay. So we need to move to Matt, but my advice on your legato. So I'm singing ta ka ta. In fact, you might want to think take a take a take. Anything that makes your mouth, you know, like Upper, a rodent, yeah. like a rodent, little yeah, yeah. little tiny mouth, and with without not a hamster. Yeah. Okay. Keep things small. Work on the legato as well as the stop staccato. The two things work hand in hand to develop a fluid and versatile double tongue technique. Yeah. I speak from experience because I would have never had a career if I didn't learn to double tongue because my single tongue. Sucks beyond all belief. Okay, thank you, Luca. Let's go on. Thank you much. Okay. Are we going now to? Uh, going
going to Matt. So Matt, can we start with the Shahrazad, please? Oh, are we doing Shahrazad or? Uh, or I what? We said Schubert, 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 Schubert. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Oh, I hope I've got Schubert here someplace. Just a minute. I can do another one if you'd like. No, I love Schubert. Why don't you play it while I while I find it? Okay. We all know how it goes. Give me about 20 seconds and I'm going to have this up on the screen. Okay, sure. Just start it one more. Are you, while I'm, while I'm doing this, are you attempting to open up the sound in the ascending third or go the opposite way? Not clear to me what your intent is. What, what would the opposite be? Closing it off or? As, a, as the upper note being a release or is the upper note the expressive note? I just want to be sure what your intent is. I I feel like it's an opening that leads into the the following note. So da 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 da. So it's a, oh, so in other words, are you are you trying to associate the second bar with the third bar? Uh, it's exactly. That's how I've been thinking. Oh, how interesting! As soon as we get the score open here, we're going to take a look and see whether you think that what goes on in the orchestra. Uh, Oh, makes sense out of that. Here, I'm almost there. Just, I'm just scrolling down to the right bar. It's an unfinished symphony, but it was long. <laughs> I had all these loaded, but what we discover is that you can only keep a certain number of IMSLP scores open. They tend to close up after a while for reasons wow. I don't really understand. So tell me, Matt, are you used to doing what I've been suggesting of score study and preparation? I've started doing it this summer some since I've been doing more mock auditions, but mm -hmm. it's really the first time I've thought about it. Okay. Well, I'm hoping that you'll w walk away from here today with a, with a real answer. Okay, so of course, the, the, the reason that you're going up is the accent, which causes us to talk about what is your understanding of an accent in Schubert? Big um, question in Schubert, big question. To me, it has something to do with intensity or weight or I imagine like if I'm pushing on myself, it would push a little harder. It's not really aggressive necessarily. Is it shorter or longer than it might, than it might be in another composer? Longer. Exactly. And very often we look at Schubert uh, accents as being really diminuendi. So they're more they're more tender as you describe them. Uh -huh. So you don't you don't want to hit them in the same way as you would an accent in Mendelssohn, say, yeah. which is more, more more precise. So there's a gentleness here. Talk to me metaphorically about what's going on. What does this mean? All this stuff, all this syncopation in the first seconds in violas. Does it make you feel calm or does it make you feel agitated? Well, they're all on, on off beats, but it's sort of gliding, which Schubert tends to do a lot. And to, to me, it's more calming than anything. You think? Yeah, so if, at if the I'll... same time, I can see how it could be almost un, unnerving or rising or you feel like it's going somewhere. Okay, so here's my, here's my problem when I hear you playing. I hear you playing as if we're getting a thon, a thon, a thon, primary beat accompaniment. One, two, three, one, two, three, and you enter. Your sound to me is not containing the sense of breathlessness that all the all these uh, syncopations give. This feeling in Schubert is as new in music. 
when you said Beethoven doing it, but Schubert in a personal way, in an, and in a new way, has this kind of <laughs> this kind of anxiousness that comes from this, and yet it's written pianissimo, so everything is suppressed and intimate. But yeah. in the color that you produce here, your color, you say that you react to this in a calm way, but the color contained with here has a sense of embedded apprehension. And if I was a violinist sitting on your committee and I heard the kind of sound that you were making, I would think to myself, has this guy li listened to the symphony? Has he in taken in the context of the accompaniment? Mm -hmm. And I would question that. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's go again. And you're thinking after, if you see what comes before, all this pizzicato transition and then in the first violin, it's very, very calm. And then suddenly, a dark place of the soul has emerged. But it's very, very quiet. Mm -hmm. And out of this comes your existential investigation of the personal implications of this accelerated heartbeat, syncopated heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Allow that to speak to you in a different way. And let's do it again. Okay, here are the problems. Your rhythm here in your 16th note, very slow. You're suddenly playing a much slower tempo. There's no way that that lingering on these 16th notes here is going to fit in with the agitato syncopated accompaniment. You're too slow here, you're too slow here. You're not paying attention to that. Right here, you see this as the high point in the orchestra. And yet, first, seconds, violas, and then the addition of the, of the cello here, the high point is here. Schubert reminds you the high point is here, and yet you've still put the high point here. Mm -hmm. Then, where does this diminuendo occur? It occurs a little quicker in the orchestra, leaving you hanging, so you, have, you start to become a little bit more introspective here because they've disappeared a little sooner than you. They have piano, and then you're forced into pianissimo. So you need to reorganize the high point of your crescendo and reorganize and be patient about your diminuendo. And the one more thing I would say, Matt, is that this is not a crescendo. In other composers, this syncopation, this accent would seem like a forte piano immediate. And I do agree that something has to happen between here and here. But I'm wondering if what happens here is more subtle and not such an obvious crescendo. Mm -hmm. That can you find a way on an E to change the color? without changing the dynamic inside you I inside I know you want to go from that you want that G to be special but wait for it <laughs> you can show still whispering increasing intensity doesn't have to be a big advanced crescendo one more time Matt, Matt, one more thing. You want to know when to come back here, don't you? How do you mean? But you you got to figure out when do you start releasing this accent if we're allowing it to be elongated. The answer uh -huh. is found right here in the accent in the first seconds in violas. This is this comes and it's gone. Use this as the cue for disappearing into the sound somewhere just after the second sixteenth of the bar. Okay, yeah. Okay, this accent is critical to the release of your accent. 
Uh-huh. Okay, one more. Matt, Matt, imagine in, in my play that I'm writing, you have a weapon in your hand because you're, you're going to take your life. That's the accent in the, in the, in the violence of violas. Right here. And then you go. I'm still breathing. The accent. Feel it. The panel listening to you will know if you're feeling it inside. All uh -huh. sorts of unbelievable metaphysical things trans translate between a performer and, a, and an experience committee. It's not only about the basics. It's about what you know in your head, which is why I'm emphasizing this. Okay, I'll shut up one more time. Play the whole solo. And keep tempo in those 16ths later on, huh? <laughs> one more time. Fantastic. Matt, did you say that you're a sophomore? That I'm a what? That you're a second year student? Yeah, I'll be starting my second year. Wonderful. If you're making great development. I think we have to end it at that. I'm sorry I just heard the one. But it's okay. lovely to hear you again. So I think, Maurizio, we should let it go at that. We're, we're already 20 minutes over. Thank you again. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, what an illumination on on the process, the preparation process that uh, a seasoned musician and pedagogue such as yourself goes through uh, in 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 this excerpt work, and, and I think it's been hugely beneficial to to our students. So I wanted to thank you on behalf of Jean Philippe uh, and everyone at Orchestre de la Francophonie and our guests listening in from the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra as well. Thank you very much for your time and sharing your expertise and experience with our students, Chris. Good, a pleasure. Study your scores, have fun. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>